All right, hello everyone. This is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman. Um, this is going to be my last video for the time being, since today is my last day as GM in residence. So hopefully it's going to be a good one about the end games. So today was uh, today is supposed to be the end, the one about Queen end games, but uh, uh, we'll do this one Rook end game uh, because I wanted to show it in the earlier videos on technique and uh, and or how to convert winning positions and or rook end games but i kind of forgot to put it in so i'll just show this one example and then i'll the rest of them will be queen end games so um so this is actually my u.s championship game against uh, a wonder liang and uh, i was black in the game i'm up two pawns should be easily winning but i misplayed it and i even made a draw so the question is what do you think is the simplest winning plan for black here. Well, if yeah, if you can if you can trade all rooks then that should be easily winning, but that will not be so easy. Um Rook b1, um, yeah, that is the correct move, rook b1, because after rook b1, white uh, cannot play b3 because of rook b2. If you go king f3, take take rook b2 and then rook b5, and it's, uh, I'm going to be up three pawns, and it's easy. And uh, if rook takes g5, I, I undouble my pawns, and now I have three connected pass pawns like this. And even though I'm giving up a pawn after b3, I'm going to lose the a5 pawn. This is still very easily winning. My pawns are going to be pushing, and it's a very simple win. So yeah, this was pretty much uh, completely game over. But instead, I, I kind of got careless. I, I think I relaxed too early. Um, and I thought this wins as well, rook c1. But after rook c1, king f3, it was already not so easy. Like I ended up playing rook c, c5. But yeah, this is already kind of a bit more difficult. He's able to keep all the rooks and uh, you know there is more to this end game than just that one moment. It's a certain end game you can study, it's in the database, but you know that was uh, that was another moment when even if you're completely winning you never want to have this lapse of concentration. When you see a good move you try to look for a better move, try to look the, at the forcing moves. Could you play after King F3, could you play the rook take G2 and then fork? Yeah, I can do that, but then uh, I can play here, and then after this I can play rook a5. And this is not entirely that easy. Like, I can even have a better version. I can play rook f1 check, king e2, rook takes g2, king takes, rook takes, rook a5. And my king is cut off, and I thought this is maybe winning, but, uh, but yeah, then... Still, I thought with these pawns, the problem is if I exchange my f pawn for the a pawn, it will probably be a draw in most cases because it's f and h pawns. Could still is still very often a draw. So this is kind of still this has technical difficulties. Um, okay, so now we move on to the main topic of the lesson. It's about queen end games. Um, I want to start off with a game I played um, against Hans Niemann last year at the at the Spice Cup, uh, which was actually one of the few tournaments over the board that. Uh, didn't get cancelled. Um, yeah, it was a very strong term. I played Hans Niemann. At that time, he was low rated, 2465, but now he's something like 2650 Fide. Uh, back then, he was 20. So he made a huge run uh, of about almost 200 points within a, within a year, basically. Yeah, this was the opening battle we'll kind of skip through. And we're going to start off with when the, I guess, from a. Uh, from around, let's see. Um, yeah, from this position. So, so what do you guys? How do you think you would um, react to this move a4 here? So white played a4, trying to question what I'm gonna do with this pawn on b5. What would you do about it? What do you think? B4 and then 
You said b4, and then try to play a5, okay. Um, possible, any other suggestions? Let's see what people on YouTube have in mind. Um, well, actually, the thing is, uh, I think b takes a4 is more drawish because before I'm actually trying to keep some pawns on the board, right? So maybe if anything, before I'm trying to play for, for a win. Actually, before is what I played, but it turned out to be a mistake because I'm putting my pawns on the color of this bishop, I'm restricting this bishop, and I'm allowing this idea knight d5, after which he gets a lot of initiative. The thing is, if he would have played knight d5 immediately, I could take, and then he go. I go queen g1, and then he kind of needs to go back to d1. But uh, after playing a4 first, now the problem is, if I give this check from g1, he goes king a2. The king actually on a2 is extremely safe. Like it seems like it's under risk, but actually it's my king that's under danger because white's pieces are putting a lot of pressure on it. So there could be some serious problems for my king here. <laughs> so the better move would be b a, which would not allow him to play knight d5, and then, you know, this would be kind of equal. Um, but I played this as a big mistake, and he could have punished me for this. So here I played queen c8, my best move, because after this and king here, like I already mentioned, this is very difficult for me. So I played queen c8, and here he could have played king a2, simple prophylactic move, just stopping all my play. Let's say queen e6, rook d7, and uh, even this endgame is horrible for me because all my pawns are weak and his rook is, more, rook is more active than mine and his knight is more active than my bishop. And my pawns are weak, so this is pretty much lost. So if he plays king a2, it's uh, pretty much a lost position. Like material is equal, but his pieces are just way better than mine. Instead, he played rook d7, a more forcing move. I played queen e8, like kind of my only move to try to keep things together. No, here at actually at this point I would have been very happy with the draw in this position, like uh, even against player much lower rated. So, um, so rook a7, bishop f6, at least I'm getting a little bit of counterplay here. He played knight d7 and here I found the uh, Pretty nice uh, idea. Does anyone want to see if they can find it? What should black do here? Well, maybe. So if we, if we play queen f2, I can play probably knight f6 and then rook a6 at the very least. And then I'm going to be up a pawn and very, very happy. Maybe even rook a6 immediately. Uh, bishop d4, um, I think also does not do much. I can play rook a6. Doesn't really have a threat. I can even play rook c7 and then if the rook moves, I can play knight e5 and queen f7, something like that. So a black has to play very precisely. He has only one move to not, not lose, pretty much. Rook c8 loses because of knight f6, pawn takes queen f7.
So bishop c3 I don't think is that good because knight f8. And I don't think, I don't see the next move here. Uh, queen e6 will lose because then knight, knight, knight f8. Queen e6, knight f8 is easily. Bishop d4, I think we can play, like I said, rook a6 or rook c7. And then if the rook moves, we can play knight e5 and we're winning. Also try to give, uh, don't just give one move, try to give a variation. Yeah, try to give a variation, don't just say one move and... Okay, uh, from now on I'm not gonna accept one move solutions. You know, you guys gotta try to work harder. Let's not be lazy here. Because, yeah, the problem with one move solutions, that means you're not really considering hard, w considering very seriously opponent's replies. So you have to make sure you always try to consider opponent's replies. Unless your move is like mate in one, you know, you shouldn't give one move solutions. Okay, queen e7, knight of six, knight, queen e7, knight d6, queen f6. Okay, that's, queen e7 is maybe an interesting defensive move, but I think after queen d5, our position is still very bad. Like it's still very, very difficult to defend here. I mean, I'm threatening rook a6. Rook d8, I guess. I can play rook a8. Still feels very, very difficult here. Because of queen d7, queen d7. And then rook is pinned. Okay, queen e 7 is probably the second best move to, you know, if you don't find the defense, probably queen e7 is relatively best. Okay, so Avinash, you got the right move, but make sure you give the variation, like explain the move. Because this is something that, okay. All right, very good. So Patrick got it, yes. So bishop takes b2 is the, okay, now people are getting it. Bishop takes b2 is very important. If king b2, queen f2 we have, and we pick up the rook on a7. And if queen takes b2, And if queen takes b2, we have b3 check. And that disturbs his harmony. So the point is after this, again, we have queen f2 checked. And material will be equal. And uh, if king a3, we can play queen e7, king there, and then queen e3. So, so king takes b3, queen e3 check. And here we got this endgame, queen a7, knight f8, and... Um, here I got a little bit careless actually, although that was maybe a blessing in disguise because I ended up winning the game uh, somehow, you know, we'll, we'll see how, but I should have played queen b7. And only after this, queen e7. And, uh, and the point is he can keep the knight, but then um, we have some perpetual ideas and uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a draw. Instead I thought king takes f8 is, uh, is a pretty easy draw, but I missed my opponent's um, winning try. So let's start with now this queen endgame from this position. So this was very interesting. So first of all, how would you try to play for a win here? Like let's try to find like a winning attempt for white, which really puts me on the back foot. Unfortunately, I missed my opponent's very strong winning attempt here. Yeah, this is not easy, but um, let's see if you can find what Hans did here. Threaten mate. Okay, so how exactly you throw, want to threaten mate? Okay, queen d3 you can play, but I think I can play queen b6 check and then... Uh, yeah, it's a threat, but it doesn't really, it's not so lethal because we can defend pretty easily and then we can play g6 and yeah, that should be a handshaking pretty soon draw. So. So 
So queen e5 and queen d4. So queen e5, I think we can give the check still, maybe. What's the... Oh, oh okay, you, you thought queen e5 was check, I see. Yeah, white found a very nice, unique idea. All right, queen c6 is an interesting try. A queen c6, though I can go queen e3 check. And I'm going to get a lot of counterplay on your pawns. So I wasn't that afraid of that move. I thought it's, it's risky. Queen d2, I guess I can play something like, maybe even king e7. It should be good enough after that. Yeah, because I cannot give a check here because of queen b4. That pawn endgame is losing, so we have to be careful. But, you know, I can play king e7. That's losing for white? That pawn endgame? Which pawn endgame? Um, the one you, you're about to show. Uh, no, no, for, for black, of course. Uh, yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah, for black. So queen c8 is, is correct, and then after king e7, what's the, what's the move? We want to try to threaten setting up a pawn man game. Yes, very good, that's the key move. And suddenly, queen c5 is a really big lethal threat. And here I suddenly thought, my gosh, I'm losing this. But somehow, somehow I managed to find, my, managed to regain my composure here and find the best move for black. The only idea that makes a draw, like it was a miracle that I even had it. Like I did not see it ahead of time. It seems like I always get lucky against Hans Niemann because my last two over the board games I played against him, I did not see the, you know, the correct move from far away, but somehow it always was there for me when I need it. You know, there was always some important ideas somewhere. So I feel like in that sense, I've been getting quite lucky against him in uh, recent games. But anyway, you know, now that we have this position, what would you do? Um, okay, so king d6, I think actually does not quite, I mean, I guess it's, uh, if you feel like you're losing, that's probably the best chance, but the problem is queen f8. I thought that the, my chances of surviving this are pretty slim. Like I'm gonna lose at least the pawn here and uh, king c6, I thought you could take this guy. And I did not think I have perpetual because queen blocks, I thought. I mean, I'm not sure, I don't, maybe that was a, uh, yeah, I thought, I, thought, I thought it loses king d6. Um, yeah, queen d7, I'm pretty sure this, it, I can go even queen a6 if I want. Um, and that's a pawn down end game. But I might be able to win with uh, takes and uh, king c5 and, uh, and a5. Not sure, though. Maybe, maybe I have to play a more accurate move here, but I think this, this one might be losing. Um, because his king is more active. So there's actually only one way I can get into a poor king and pawn ending him that's actually not losing. It's a pretty crazy idea. And that was, I, it, was, it was kind of, I, I thought it was my only move. And f5, I don't think helps. I mean, like at the very least, I can take this pawn, right? Um, queen b6, then queen c5. And then he takes my pawn. Yeah, I mean, okay, this is a very hard one, so I guess I'll show it to you. But it's a very nice concept. I played h5. Okay, that move looks completely crazy because I'm basically allowing queen c5 check, right? Now, white had other moves, but they don't really lead too much. But I thought queen c5 is... But then, the thing is I go g6, and the big, the big idea I saw here is that I have... I still have two spare tempos, f6 and f5. And the thing is, when he goes ahead and uh, goes after my pawn with king b6, I 
Okay, I think somebody just asked the question. What if I do queen d6? Which which line is this? Oh, okay, oh, okay. it's oh oh. I see what you're saying here in queen d6. Uh huh. Yeah, then I think uh, I can go king b4. And then uh, I can threaten to take and king a5. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it wasn't working. I checked this yesterday with the engine again, and basically h5 was the only move that was not losing. So you can check it for yourself as well. But yeah, it was actually the only move that wasn't losing. Like, it was a miracle that, that I had this move. Like, I could have easily not had it, and then I would have lost. But yeah, it was... Uh... So yeah, queen c5, he played, takes, takes, and g6. And the thing about this g6 move, very strong move, is that I fix his pawns, he can't go f5, he can't do anything there. And if he tries to go king b6, I go here, then I go king c6, and he actually his king is cut off. And it seems like he should still win with the move a5, like if, because if here, then king c5, right? So it seems like he should still win because of a5, but then I can play this move f6, and I still have a spare tempo, and then after this I can go king c7. And then the reason I played f6 is so that after a6, now I play f5, and I have that second spare tempo, and then I can make the draw. King here, king c8, here, king c7, it's a draw. Actually, no, here I'm winning, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, so he has to be careful, you know, and go back, king a7. But, and if he tries f5 here, what move do I play here for black? What's, the, what's my drawing idea? Yes, f4 takes and then, okay. yes, very good. And this is a draw, <laughs> quite incredibly. So this was, this was truly a miracle that somehow, you know, I was just in time to make this draw. Um, and he cannot do anything about it, his king gets stuck. And I have two spare tempos, that's really important. Okay, f5 does not really help because I take. And again, it's the same thing here, I play f6. And I always have this f4 idea. It's going to be the same thing. Yeah, anyway, so this was very, very interesting. Um, so my opponent, Hans, tried king d5. He tried to trick me in some other ways. But then I played uh, king f6. Because I realized if he goes back, I go back again. So I'm not worried about losing the a6 pawn now, once I found this setup. So he played... Uh, King c6, I played king e6. Oops, what's happening? Wait, okay, yeah, king e6. King c5, he's trying to somehow outflank me, but I played king e7 because I guess I thought if king here, king d5, he's getting something with that position. Like I saw some line like here, and then he goes f5. And after this, king f5. So this was his other idea. He wanted to play this, and then after this, he wanted to play g4 and make an outside pass pawn potentially. Or maybe a5, I, I don't remember what exactly it was, but this I thought was a bit dangerous. But I played king e7, so like, again, if this, I can always go here. And if this, I go here, so I'm not letting him, you know, get any kind of winning ideas here. So I had to be still very precise. But at this point, I was already optimistic that I'm drawing. So he played there, I played here. He played king d6, I played king f5. He tried a5, and now I played f6. And the thing is, um, and what happened here was something very unfortunate. I wish, I didn't really wanna, of course I don't really like to win like this. Um, basically my opponent was getting low on time and he kept desperately looking, he kept desperately looking for a win, but it, it was not there unfortunately for him and so he couldn't find it. And uh, basically he forgot about his clock, he lost on time. So it's very painful. Of course at this point it should have been a draw and that would have been a fair result. So it was very, it was a kind of a big pity because um, he was he was on a very good run and then he lost this game and then he had a bad tournament kind of because of this game. Uh, but I was very happy that, you know, after this tournament where, you know, he lost such a painful game, he made such a recovery and then he went to Europe and he made a, uh, a norm, his last norm right after that and he got to 2,500 and, uh, you know, ever since he's been on a, on a tear, he's won numerous tournaments. He won the US Junior, he got to over well over 2600, so I mean it was uh, a lot of kudos to him after such a painful game, such a painful tournament to to be able to recover. How old is 
Uh, I don't exactly know. It could 19 or 20 or something like that. Yeah, he's the star of the juniors, so he's under 21, I think. He's definitely under 21. I think it's either 19 or 20. Yeah. I don't know exactly. but Yeah, so that was an interesting game, um, you know, where uh, most tournaments did not happen. Well, this one did, and it uh, brought this exciting game. Um, but unfortunately, I also did not have a good tournament. I lost the very next game after that, so somehow this lucky win did not bring me luck after that. Um, but okay, what, what to do? Um, yeah, so this game is actually, uh, let me just, just maybe, the, I, I think I'll skip this game one second. Yeah, um, let me think. Okay, this is a, this is a, oh, actually Hans is only 18. Um, okay, this is a little bit of an end game study with queens on the board, so let's see how you guys do with this one. White to play and win. Obviously, if he wants to make a draw, he can do it in many different ways. Well, I mean, okay, it's, uh, I mean, I was, I was upset when I lost to Fabiano Caruana, right? Like, I think, you know, we're competitors, right? The way, I mean, and, and I mean, it makes sense he's upset, like, and now he's higher rated than me. So, you know, he, he, he probably did not really consider me a strong GM, so, at that time. Uh, so, no, I think uh, you can't really respect any player too much because, um, you know, then you're limiting yourself to reaching your your potential and it's it's also not just about losing but it's also about how you lose right okay if you get upset you know you, you, you know if you get outplayed then okay you shouldn't necessarily get upset but i mean it does not doesn't matter against whom right you you can get up you know you can get outplayed by a lower rated than but if they play an amazing game i mean kudos to them right but if it's uh, unnecessary loss that's what you're upset about typically um all right, so g7 is correct, queen takes. Yeah, and then we have to find the, the mating sequence here. Mating or we're winning some material. Yes, exactly, Daniel, Daniel Narditsky beat Fabi, even though uh, Daniel, you know, did not have the best tournament. He, he lost a lot of games also, but, you know, against Fabi, he played a really nice game, especially the technique. So, you know, yeah, you have to believe you can win. and. Uh, Otherwise, there's no point of even sitting across the board uh, playing. Okay, you, won't, you might not always get a chance to win, but you have to always believe. Queen b8, queen e7, I, oh, queen e, king e7 you meant, okay. Queen d8, king e6, okay, let's continue. This is correct. Yeah, queen d7, king f6. Yeah, queen d4, king here. Yes, very good. And then queen h4 mate. Very nice. Very nice fourth sequence. Yeah. Okay. All right, so here's another interesting exercise. Um, black to play. What should black do here? <clears throat> okay, let's not say kill pawn, right? We're, we're serious chess players here. You can say capture or you know, <laughs> we're serious players here, so let's not be silly. Like that's a bit like that's a bit 
H6? Yes, exactly. Yeah, H6 is a pretty serious threat. Yeah. All right, people on YouTube looks like are getting the right idea. <coughs> so if we play, if we attack the rook, we have to ask ourselves, can white still play h6, right? Because as Sam Shankland always says in his videos, in his lectures, he says, um, when, um, when we have a very dangerous idea and you think that opponent stops us, we have to ask ourselves, can we still do it anyway? That's something he always talks about in all his videos. Right, so that's something we have to always keep in mind. So if you think you're playing queen e2 to stop h6, you have to ask yourself, are you actually stopping h6? Can you still do it anyway? So that's the, that's the question. So that's something you got to calculate. Queen e2 is certainly a very tempting move, or queen c2, or any of these moves, but but what happens after h6? Can he get away with h6 and giving you the rook with check or no? So yes, g3 is, the, is a very strong move here. And I think uh, people on YouTube are also getting it. The problem is if you play a move like we, obviously g takes is losing because takes takes and then rook comes in rook lift i mean and wins okay maybe rook not rely right away but you have to do it in the correct way and if you play uh, queen c2 or queen e2 after h6 takes the problem is that there is king h2 and only after this king g2 and now there is no more queen f3 check right so very precise calculation is required and now we simply lose this we get made it so we play g3, disturbing is harmony. We're trying to take on f2, trying to exchange queens because the queen on f6 is very important. And after this, we can play queen e2 or queen b3. And now after this, I'm sorry, h6, we can take and go queen d2, queen h6, and we are winning the game. So yes, g3 is the correct idea. Okay, here's another exercise. Uh, black to play. Uh, yeah, here we're fighting to make a draw because white has a very uh, menacing pawn on c6. How should we do it? We have several options. Yes, f f4 definitely is a move we have to consider. Um, yeah, and then there's also maybe other moves too, but yeah, we definitely have to consider f4 and, uh, and see if, but now, you know, you have to analyze what will happen after f4, right? So don't just stop there. Don't just give me one move solutions. That's a lazy approach to chess. Uh, let's try to analyze, you know, whether or not white can then do something which could try to play for a win. All right, queen b6, we'll also take a look at that. Um, don't think that will save us, but um, okay, we'll, we'll look at that next. No, of course, I understand, I understand the point of a four. Of course, if they go c7, we give perpetual, but the question is, does white have anything better? Yes, exactly. Uh, f4, we can play queen e5, and after king h7 or something, or king somewhere, the problem is you can now go c7 and then um, and then you've defended the e1 square, right? So this this will not be perpetual anymore. That's the big problem. So yeah, he can include queen e5, right? And he and then you don't have perpetual. So f4 unfortunately does not work. It will lose. Queen b6 also loses, I think, because queen e5 check. Let's say king g8. And now we can play c7 and queen e8 is a threat. We also have queen c3 idea. So we will lose this pretty easily. So black needs to do something else here.
I see. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. But let's try to understand why the why that's the answer. Okay, queen e3. That's that move is also interesting. I guess thinking after c7 f4. That's actually pretty clever. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work because I can go queen g3, queen c3. Very strong maneuver. And then that's still winning for white. So it's a very clever try, hoping for c7, f4, but it doesn't, it doesn't quite draw. Queen takes b2 is the, yes, the correct move. And the point of queen b2 is not so much because we want the pawn. It's more to control this very important square c3, which white very often controls. And also control e5. So the key is we're controlling all these dark squares. And we're controlling the pawn. And now the problem is white cannot make any progress. Because in order, he, in order for him to win the game, he needs to promote the pawn. But if he plays something like Queen d7, queen d8, we start checking him. And this will be perpetual on the e1 square. So queen takes b2 is a very strong, very strong move. So yeah, sometimes these queen endgames are a little bit counterintuitive. You have to just calculate. And uh, ultimately, it's about process of elimination sometimes also. Because once you see f4, you see all your opponent's ideas, like queen e5. And uh, yeah, queen g3, all these queen c3 ideas, then you can figure out that maybe I should take this pawn. It's not easy, but again, you guys are all good players, so I'm trying to do some challenging ones for you. Okay, let's look at um, another one. Mm. Ah, okay, this is actually from, yeah, this is a game from my students. The player playing white is the player playing black is my student and I gave the ratings but I kept the names away because of uh Yeah, the thing is it's not about the pawn on b2, right? It's more about the the c3 square, right? It's 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 more about uh an e5 square, right? So it's the pawn is meaningless, you're right, but it's more about other things. Um, all right, so here we have a interesting position. Okay, so this is a, okay, this is an interesting position here. Um, so black has a dilemma of where to move the queen. It has several options. Where should black move the queen here and why? Oh, uh, what do you think? I think he's probably happy with equality here, right? Because white seems to, he can win a lot of pawns. So I think that um, we're pretty probably gonna be happy with the draw here. Although if we find something better then you know, more power to you. Sir? Sure, yeah, but I think this, this one is not that great because take, take rook b7, I mean, you're gonna lose a pawn and now this is weak. And if you go rook e8, I can go king f2. So that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem very, very good. So yeah, we have, I think queen d5, we don't, we don't wanna play here. So the real question is, uh, we need to somehow create counterplay towards this king and you use this pawn on h3 as some kind of attacker. But the question is, do we go queen h5, queen g4, queen f5? Like which one of these moves?
Make sure you give explanation, but don't just give, don't just give a move. Maybe give a, a variation and or explanation. Okay, so we have to kind of compare queen f5 and queen, G, queen, queen h5, right? So, so in the game, black played queen h5. Queen f5 is indeed the best move. Um, and the main reason why queen f5 is the best move is because after queen takes b7, rook g8, queen takes c6, white is going to try to take all these pawns and uh, cover the g2 square. But the difference now is we can go queen b1 check and queen takes b2. Uh, and we want win these important pawns. So white plays rook e2. But now we play queen c1 and by winning that b2 pawn, now we opened up our b file for rook b8, rook b1 in order for us to create you know, sufficient counterplay. So this is actually very important. Very important idea. Uh, the problem is when we go queen h5 or queen g4, after white does the same thing, now queen d1 doesn't do very much because king f2, queen c2, rook e2, and white keeps this very important pawn. So the point is we needed to check on b1, to take on b2 and then play rook b8. Right? That one pawn was a big, very big difference. So when you compare these variations, this is a big improvement uh, for white. And now white is winning here. Um, so black tried rook b8 anyway. b3, rook queen g4, queen c7. Yeah, here king f2 was um, possible. Queen c7, rook g8, king f2, queen f5, rook e1. Queen c2. And here rook c8 actually was, was fine. Uh, so black missed that. Queen c2 here, queen c1. Queen d7, f5. White should be winning here. Too many extra pawns. But white actually made a mistake uh, here. So what here the question is, I mean, this position looks completely winning. Uh, but how should we, what's the best way to try to convert this? Still not entirely easy, even though we're up, um, two, three, four, five. even though we're up two pawns, still not that easy because black gets queen h1 counterplay. So we need to try to uh, play precisely, find a winning plan. So black's idea is queen h1, right? So we have to make sure we were prepared for him playing queen h1. All right, so queen f3 is what white is what white played, but then what do you do after queen d4 check? Well, queen e3, I'm going to go back, right? It's just a repetition where our queen was on e3. So if you're going to go like this, we're just repeating moves, right? Mm -hmm. So queen d4, okay, king f1. Queen, f queen f1, I go queen d1 check. And now you have to go back because rook e1, rook queen f3. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy. Rook e3 was played in the game, but that's not so good. After rook e8, suddenly we're in that pin, and then it became very difficult to win. Maybe not even winning. So you have to be, you know, you have to kind of be, be careful here. 
All right, looks like Hamilton got the right idea. We play the move g4 here, a double exclamation mark. And the point is we free the g3 square for the king, where the king is safe. And the point is after this, we have king g3, and white is winning. And after fg, we have uh, king g3. And then we take on g4, and, uh, and white, is, white is winning. Um, uh, yeah, king g3 is probably the simplest. Just pick up all the pawns, and then black's king becomes weak. And yeah, this would have been a simple win. But g4 is not an easy move to find. But yeah, sometimes in queen endgames, you have to always look at, you know, unusual ideas. Why not queen d6 before g4? Queen d6? You mean queen d3? I guess you meant queen d3, but then I can play queen h4. Oh, queen e6, queen e6. Um, I don't know, maybe I can play rook h8. And after g4, maybe I can go queen h1. Yeah, I don't know, maybe this also wins, but I think it's unnecessary. I think g4 and then king, king here is easier. Because the queen is very good here, it protects a lot, a lot of weak squares. So I really don't think we need queen e6 here. Although maybe the other one also wins, but also we have to worry about queen d4 here. I don't know. It's possible. I just think g4 is simpler because black cannot do much. Because we're not worried about this pawn really that much. I'm going to take it probably next move. Actually, so yeah, in the game, white played this. Rook e3, rook e8. Queen e2, rook e3. And this endgame turned out to be, uh, to be a draw. Like White cannot make progress, surprisingly, up two pawns. It looks winning, but the p queen f3 was a very strong move, threatening queen h1. And that pawn on h h3 is still a very big nuisance. White was still trying to win, even here. But here, actually, he is now in danger of losing. It, it became a two-queen endgame. Four-queen endgame, I meant to say. Pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, and, and in the four queen end game, Black still had a winning chance with g5, but um, Black played this and blundered into a perpetual. And finally, the game ended in a draw. So exciting, exciting battle there between two young players. All right, now I want to show a game uh, of MVL. MVL against Dingleren, and uh, I want to, <clears throat> you know, see if you guys could play better than Ding here. So where was the position? Let's see, this was good. Yeah, maybe black could have played better earlier, but it was still winning. Yeah, and this is the critical moment. Um, so should black, um, I guess our choices are, do we take on g6, do we play f5, or do we play c2? Which, which one do we play and why? We have to calculate, we have to make sure we play the right one. Here, Ding Loren, who is great, and this was a classical game too. He chose the wrong one and lost. Uh, sorry, uh, drew, drew the game, sorry. Didn't lose, but still was winning, so.
So I'll give you guys a few minutes to think on this one. F5 is, F5 is logical in some ways, but the problem is it's also illogical because we're leaving them with this very dangerous pawn. So after F5, we can play something like Queen F4. And after C2, we play G7, for example, and I don't know. You can't quite queen your pawn, and uh, what are you going to do with the G pawn? That's still a very big nuisance. So I'm not so sure. So in the game, black actually did play c2, and it looks completely winning for black because it seems like white needs to, uh, you know, take or. But white actually can get away with. The thing is, white, white could get away with playing, g7. No, sorry. What what happened in the game? Yeah, g7 actually would lose, but white can get away with gf. And the thing about this is that if queen f7, this is already a, a perpetual. And uh, if you queen, somehow this four queen endgame, even though it looks completely winning for black, because black is the one starts the checks, somehow amazingly enough, uh, despite this attack, the white queens just control all the squares and there's no mate, right? So this is one of these where it feels like there somehow should be a, a win, but but there is not. It's just incredible. Right? So this is just one of the more beautiful examples. Uh, and they, yeah, they agree to a draw. There is no, I mean, the queens somehow protect each other in in, in the most improbable way that there is no I mean, there were traps in the middle of the way, but there's just nothing to be done. It was it was a draw, like the engine just always showed draw. So it's pretty incredible. Um, so I guess I think uh, Ding Loren just didn't realize that you can play like this and it's still a draw. Like he, I guess he thought C2 is very easily winning. But the thing is, um, he could play this, and I think this is. Um, this is very simple, and uh, the thing to keep in mind in queen endgames is the importance of centralized queen. I hear the queen is centralized, and because of that, it shields from a lot of checks. And the white pawn is still very far away, so we got rid of the main counterplay. Meanwhile, the c3 pawn is still lethal. Black is, has the setup king c1, I mean, sorry, b c2, king b2, and white kind of, you know, does not really, cannot really do very much against this queen on d5. And, and so this position is, is winning. But again, I mean, I guess, you know, it's a tricky situation because like, even though you think this is winning, it's going to take a long time maybe. And then the other position, I guess you think that he cannot just make a queen like that because, yeah, two queens will mate. But, you know, you cannot take anything for granted, right? And uh, when you're not 100% sure, it's better to play kind of something that's more, kind of more of a guarantee. Because here, at least, you know, white cannot do anything with this pawn. And then, yeah, king d2, c2, this setup should be a uh, fairly easy win. But this just goes to show that even not, it's not easy always for top GMs, especially in time pressure. And now I want to end this lesson with like a very unfortunate, um, moment in my chess career, which maybe was a blessing in disguise because I had a very bad tournament, that tournament, but that didn't set me up to have a lower rating. And, and then I played the World Cup that same year, one month later, and I beat the higher rated player, Pavel Ilyanov. And maybe if I would have had a higher rating, I would have played someone lower, maybe I would have lost. You never know. Um, it was a little bit strange. But anyway, things happen always for a reason. And in this tournament, and I started, it was Canadian Open 2017. I started two out of two. I was doing very well this game against an IM, who I think is now a GM, Keiichi Young. And, uh, you know, things were going pretty well. I outplayed him in a very nice game. And eventually we got, we got a Queen End game. 
yeah, it was, it was also a nice calculation at some point on my part, like it was this, d3. Yeah, his only move is knight c4 to not lose immediately because otherwise I go d2, d, d3. D. Then he played this and then I found this nice idea, knight e3, queen c2. He queened, I played queen c2. And now, what is his only way not to lose immediately? What is his way not to lose immediately? To keep the game going. Well, queen g3 is losing because it's very easy because I go check, I take, and then I go d2. That, that's very easy for black. That's not really, uh, we have something that's giving, giving us a better chance. It's still lost, but it's not, not immediately losing. No, queen g2 is mate threat, right? Oh, okay. And a queen b2 does not help, we, we take that. So queen b2 we cannot play. So there is only one way to continue the game here, which... Queen h8, well, you're close here, yeah, you have to give up the queen, the problem is I take. And here you're still in that same dilemma. Yes, queen takes g6, you have to at least open up my king. And then you give this check on e8. And then you take the knight, and the difference is that, the, of course, I would have loved to go king h7, and hopefully he takes the knight, and then I play d2 and win immediately. Sadly for me, queen e4 check happens, and then I cannot get out of checks, and it's a draw. So unfortunately, I had to play king f6, and then he keeps checking me. He keeps checking me, and then once my king is on b3 and a worse square, then he takes the knight and then my pawn is spinned. Now the thing is this position is still completely winning. And at this point I had like around close to an hour and he had the uh, increment basically, 30 seconds a move, he had like a minute or two. Yeah, and here I did not show the best technique. I've, I should probably start with queen c3, king c2. That would have been by far the, the simplest. Queen e4, king b2, check king c1 and that should be a pretty routinely winning. Somehow I overthought this. I tried queen c7, gaining a tempo with the check. And then I played here, but I guess I underestimated he can pin my pawn, and somehow it's still not easy, so I kind of thought I'm gaining a tempo, but actually I'm not, because his king wants to go to g1 and f2 anyway. So now I played queen c3, king f1. I played g5, probably a useless move also, h4. I was kind of har having a hard time finding a plan here. King b2, queen d5, king c2, queen f5, queen c4. So I want to play king c1 and then d2. But he goes king here, and now if I go here, he takes. Still not easy, so I played back. So yeah, I was, I was having a hard time finding a plan. I played king d1. King c1 is probably still better, and you know, playing this, probably still winning. Because the in the queen end game, the most important is the quality of the pawns over quantity, very often. But yeah, uh, king d1, queen e4, and, uh, and here was my infamous uh, moment of my chess career. I don't think, I mean, there's a couple of other people, GMs who've done that, but you know, that was a very, that was one of my most embarrassing moments, but you know, it just goes to show it happens to absolutely everyone. Uh, here I think I was planning to play d2, but then the problem is there's queen here, queen c1, and now he has a very strong move to make a draw. Does anyone s try to see if they can find it? White to play and make a draw. How does white make a draw here? He 
Yeah, there's a way to make a draw for sure. Queen a2 is correct because that threatens queen a4 and then queen a1. And then here I don't, I cannot get out of checks. Every other move still gives me chances. Queen d3, for example, queen c2, queen e4, queen c2. But, the, because, but if, after queen a2, queen c2 does not help because there's still checks. So queen a2 is the key move. So anyway, I was calculating some lines. I couldn't find anything. You know, I should have played something like king c1. But, you know, I thought I'll be clever. I'll play queen c2. Then I'll try to play d2. And then I'll go king c1. And as soon as I played queen c2, I unfortunately let go. And then to my horror, I, and in total shock, I realized that I self-mated myself. Queen e1. And I, I don't, I, I think I just, um, was so shocked I didn't even let him play the move. I was just kind of s uh, sat there in shock and kind of just resigned or something. Like, it ob obviously he was seeing it. Uh, so, yes, that was... Uh, it just goes to show that, yeah, if you ever have... Uh, the reason I brought it up is like it just goes to show queen endgames could be very humbling. That's Queen endgames can sometimes make the best of all of us, right? So it's... Uh, they are probably one of the most challenging endgames that exist because they involve a lot of calculation and uh, a lot of care. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can never relax in queen endgames. There can always be surprises. So um, yeah, and hopefully yeah, if you have a bad moment like that, you just remember that you can even, even GMs have these moments too. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this class today and uh, and I'll see you guys. Well, actually, it's my last class with you guys. Uh, it's my last day today with GM and residents. But I really enjoyed working with all of you. And hopefully you, you all enjoy uh, your next GM. Um, all right. Take care.